Hi, my name is Edgar James. I'm a certified public accountant and I'm talking to you today uh, on behalf of the Community Financial Literacy Project, a uh, brainchild between myself and uh, the producer, Black Sparks, who's the TV promoter uh, for this uh, uh, and other segments that we're going to put together. Uh, so I wanted to introduce myself, uh, some of my background. I was a uh, um, uh, internal revenue service agent for 11 years, uh, manager, a regional analyst uh, for 13 states at a point in time, uh, taught college for a few years, uh, taught principles of accounting, intermediate accounting, uh, and I've been in my own practice for the past 20 years. So uh, specializing in not-for-profits, uh, small businesses, and uh, just about anything else that I could do, income taxes, uh, and I've had a, a pretty good time at it. But we wanted to take the time to share some of our skills uh, with the community so that we could hopefully uh, develop some better community relations and increase everyone's prosperity and wealth just based on sharing. So uh, we're going to start out, uh, our outline is basically to speak on some issues that have come about in some conversation uh, about the formation of businesses, the different types of businesses. There are uh, personal budgeting and financing, and uh, another issue that we'll get to, uh, if not in this segment, in another segment uh, about pooling resources uh, for the advancement of everyone in the pool. Uh, so we'll be looking to do that, uh, but at first uh, we're going to answer some basic questions. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind is why a person would want to go into business, and there are many reasons for it. Uh, for one, many people like ownership uh, as opposed to another arrangement uh, whereby you have simple employment. Uh, others would like a greater independence in their doings and have a creative idea or skill or talent that they can use to parlay into financial success. Uh, usually the goal is to have some type of financial independence or the ability to do those things that one uh, desires to do. Uh, there are a couple of ingredients that are needed in any type of business endeavor or doing. Uh, one of the primary ones is interest and sincerity in doing what you're doing. Uh, the other would be capital. Uh, there's always going to be a need and as we talk about you know, what capital really is, uh, we'll think in terms of money for now. Uh, but you need capital in order to further your idea. Uh, but we'll start at the very basics. Uh, we're going to go back to at the formation of a business, what types of options are available to you when you start up. What matters also is at the end result, what's going to be the tax impact of what you're doing. Uh, each of the forms of business has its nuances, and each one of them has the end result of being presented on an income tax return for your federal and state or sometimes local purposes. So we'll go through some of those items and hopefully if there's any other questions you can reach us at a later point in time and we can speak with you at great depth on any of these things. But for now we want to speak about the basic uh, items and what their differences and similarities are. Uh, sole proprietorship is the number one form of business. That's when one individual uh, desires to go into business for themselves. Um, it has its reporting simply put on a Schedule C on a Form 1040 for tax purposes. Uh, to open this type of business, one would need to obtain a, a, a permit from their local uh, county clerk. Uh, uh, then there's a necessary fee, I think $125 in Kings County at least, obtain an EIN number from Internal Revenue Service, uh, then you're able to open a corporate, I mean, a, excuse me, a sole proprietor's bank account. At that point, you're able to do business in the state, but there's some other 
items that come along with it. If you employ people, for example, you'd be necessarily having to get disability, workers' comp, unemployment insurance, and some other items. Uh, but for now, that's a simple formation, and we'll leave it at that for this moment. Uh, next, uh, we hear a lot about limited liability companies, uh, affectionately called LLCs. A limited liability company uh, simply is a sole proprietorship with corporate protection around it. Uh, as we get into types of liability and why one would have different formations, uh, usually the reduction or attempt to reduce liability would be one of the reasons. Uh, you'd want to reduce the extent of your risk uh, based on your formation. So an LLC gives some risk because inside the LLC, uh, the results of your risk are there. Uh, there's nothing that you could lose greater than what you've invested in the LLC. So that goes the uh, reason for wanting to reduce your liability or the attempt to do so. Uh, but in the formation of it, you'd have to uh, obtain a filing receipt from the Secretary of the State uh, whereby your articles of organization would be approved uh, for your formation. Uh, one of the expenses, uh, that expense is not so great. It's probably $110 or depending. Uh, but you'd be required to advertise in a daily paper for six days and in a weekly paper for six weeks. That will uh, be an expense that will be borne by you just to become a formation. Uh, then you would obtain the employer identification number from IRS and proceed to open your bank accounts and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's more expensive than forming at the county clerk because you'd be required to go through the entire formation to be legitimately recognized. Okay, so then that scenario with an LLC can be further complicated where you have two or more people or members they're called in the LLC uh, again the issue is not so much the formation but the end result having to be reported on a particular type of tax return or not when you have two or more members you have to elect to report as a subchapter S corporation for tax purposes or as a partnership. These are two different tax reporting methodologies uh, that flow through to the individual but require preparation of a subchapter S return and a K-1 or partnership 1065 return and K-1s for the partners. Uh, not knowing this could be disastrous for a formation where one had no, indi no knowledge of how they would report the end results of their well doings in business for the year. So it matters that you understand this right at the formation. Uh, the corporation is the <clears throat> a more common form of organization uh, where there are uh, shareholders in a particular entity. That's formed with the Secretary of the State. You obtain a filing receipt. Uh, articles of incorporation are approved for filing. Uh, at that time, you can obtain your employer ID number um, and a bank account. Essentially, you're going to have articles, you're going to have minutes and bylaws, you're going to have some corporate records that are going to be required for the maintenance of any of these organizations. The LLC, the corporation, each of them have uh, record requirements that are necessary. Now, if you're in a corporation, there are two uh, forms, at least two forms, uh, the regular corporation and then the subchapter S corporation. One, the regular corporation is an entity of its own. Uh, the other is an entity of its own except the results flow through to the owners, shareholders, I should say. Uh, that uh, matters in the sense of your planning,
your agreements in business, uh, what you're doing, uh, joint ventures or typically partnerships for a time. So if you're operating as a sole proprietor and you go together with another individual, you're actually a partnership. Uh, when does that end? When either of the partners say that it ends. But what you need to do is register properly as a partnership instead of thinking two individuals can split up one pie as sole proprietors. Uh, there's no uh, uh, tax mechanism set for that. That would be uh, actually acting as a partnership of <laughs> two sole proprietors. It's not something that people would want to venture into. And by choosing the right formation, you can get your business off on the right foot. Now, each of these is can be misunderstood, and each of them have has their place in the particular plan that you may have for business. So we want to cover that uh, at a later date in more detail, uh, and we're going to entertain some questions. So we're going to get ready to answer some questions at this point, and uh, we'll come back and rehash and recap at the end, and uh, hopefully if there's any questions, uh, let us have them. Uh, you've just been witnessing some of our segments and the beginning of our community literacy project. And what I wanted to share was our book of the week. It's uh, a book by an artist, uh, 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 author George S. Clayson. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. The Richest Man in Babylon is a great book to look at and essentially uh, without uh, uh, telling you. Uh, there's three guys, one who's poor, one who's uh, in between or getting by, and another who's wealthy. And the wealthy guy shares his story of why he came out different from the others. Essentially, it was a savings methodology whereby you pay yourself the first 10% of your doings. The second 10% was to go to charity and for the use of to others. The 80% would be to used to pay your bills and other obligations as they come due. Uh, this theory would uh, guarantee that you have 10% of everything that you ever did have uh, and it seems to work pretty good. Uh, the 80% would cover the government and those other items that many people may not see in the math. Uh, so this would be a good thing to uh, get uh, it's a easy reading, and I would suggest get it for all children. <laughs> uh, junior high school and up should all read this.